let's do some A-level physics paper three practice. Here is quite a tricky question. So we have a loudspeaker mounted on a bench is emitting sound of frequency 1.7 kilohertz to a microphone. So figure 5.1 shows an illustration of the bulk movement of the air at one instant of time. So we have the loudspeaker, we have compressions and rarefactions. So longitudinal waves can be quite tricky to visualize, so we will keep that in mind. So the maximum displacement of the air particles is given as that. The speed of sound in air is 17 degrees. Quite a lot of information. On figure 5.2, sketch the sinusoidal variation of the displacement of the air with distance between C and R. So the way we tackle these is as follows. Now, I always tend to think of longitudinal waves in terms of two pictures in mind. So one picture looks like this. Whenever we have a compression and a rarefaction, let's say that we have a compression, all of the particles are moving towards that point, like so. That point itself, the compression, has a displacement of zero. What's a little bit tricky about this problem is that there's no positive or negative direction, so I'm just going to choose one. I think the mask scheme actually accepts both, but I'm just gonna say that going to the right is positive. So if we do that, the left neighbor of a compression will have a positive displacement and the right hand neighbor will be going the other way will have a negative displacement. A rarefaction on the other hand will be different. So if we have a rarefaction the left hand neighbor will be going away from that point and the other neighbor will also be going away from it. So x will be zero here we're gonna have x is negative because it's going to the left and here it's going to the right, so it's going to be positive. Rarefactions and compressions have a displacement of zero. How would it actually look like? Well, here we have a compression, then we have a compression and then we have a rarefaction. This will be a total of one and a half wavelengths. So let's try and draw this. We're also given the amplitude here, which is minus 2.0 times 10 to the minus six. And this here is 2.0 times 10 to the minus six. And this is displacement in meters. So let's say that this here is my first part. This here will be my compression. This here will be my second compression. And this here should be my rarefaction. So if this here is point C and this here is point R, notice something. So C has, if we were to carry that on, so let's say somewhere over here, its neighbor on the left is gonna have positive displacement and its neighbor on the right is gonna have a negative displacement. This here is a compression. This one here, on the other hand, is gonna be a rarefaction because it has a negative on the left, like so, and a positive displacement. So both of these particles will be moving away from it. This one here is gonna be the next compression because it's positive on the left. So basically this one is this one, and then this one is this one. And then the next time we cross the axis is gonna be a this rarefaction. It will have a negative to the left, and if we were to continue the graph, it will be sort of positive across here. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, we also need to put some scales on the x-axis. Apologies, my graph is uh, turning a little bit messy. So what scales should we choose? Um, do we have the wavelength? Well, we're given the speed of sound and we are also given the frequency. So I can probably just use something like wavelength is speed of sound divided by frequency to work it out. So this will be 340 over 1700. So that's just gonna be 0 0.2. So from here to here, okay, so that's quite all right. This is gonna be one wavelength. So this is gonna be 0 0.1, it's gonna be 0 0.2. This one here is gonna be 0.3, and I'm gonna make sure that this point is labeled very clearly as R, and this one is C. This one here will be 0.4. This here is distance in meters. Okay, this will do. 
On figure 5.2, mark one point where particles are moving at maximum speed, label it x. So this happens whenever we cross the x-axis because realistically the particles are moving like they do in simple harmonic motion. So the largest possible speed will be as they pass through that equilibrium displacement where x is equal to zero. And then we need to mark one point where the particles are moving with maximum speed but traveling in the opposite direction. So this will just be two adjacent ones. So let's say that this one here is also x and this one here is also gonna be also y. We could have also picked this one and this one or this one and this one. Any two adjacent x intercepts will do. Okay, next one, calculate the maximum speed v max of the oscillating particles in the actual sound wave. Well, this question, this is very typical for paper three, is mixing up loads of different uh, parts of the specification into one question. So we're just going to use the good old V is equal to plus or minus omega square root of A squared take away X squared. So the maximum speed happens when X is equal to zero. So V is equal to plus or minus omega A. So to work out the maximum speed of the particles, which is the next question, we'll just use V is equal to plus or minus omega A, which is gonna be plus or minus two pi F multiplied by the amplitude. I'm pretty much given all of these numbers. So it's gonna be two pi times frequency is 1,700 multiplied by the amplitude, which is 2.0 times by 10 to the power of minus six. Okay, so I got around 2.1 multiply this by 10 to the power of minus two meters per second. Okay, next one, the root mean square speed, CRMS of the air molecules in the room. Yet another topic that's actually linked into this. This is great. The molar mass of air is this much. So if we're looking for the RMS speed, I'm probably just gonna use a half mv squared. In other words, m CRMS squared is gonna be equal to three halves kT. So all I need is the mass of an individual molecule to work it out. So if I know that one mole is 2.9 times 10 to the power of minus two, because one mole has 6.02 times 10 to the power of minus 23 particles, I can work out the mass of one particle. So now I know that the mass of one particle is 4.8 times by 10 to the minus 26 kg. I can just plug this, I'm running out of space here a little bit. I can just rearrange for CRMS and plug in the actual numbers. So CRMS is gonna be equal to, use your space wisely in the actual exam. So it's gonna be three times 1.38 times 10 to the power of minus three. And then this temperature here needs to be in Kelvin. So that's gonna be multiplied by 17 plus 273 close bracket divided by the mass, which is 4.8 times by 10 to the power of minus 26. And this here is gonna give me exactly 500 meters per second. Let's make this a little bit more legible. Okay, this question then moves on to a six marker. Students are given the equipment of figure 5.1 together with a meter ruler. They're also given a second loudspeaker connected to the same signal generator at 1.7 kilohertz. They're asked to design an experiment where they would need to take just one measurement and be able to determine the value of the speed of sound. They set up the experiment in two different ways as shown. Okay, so one is with one a uh, loudspeaker across here, and then one across here, and then we have the microphone there. In method A, the microphone is fixed and one loudspeaker is moved to the left. So as I'm reading this, I'm thinking how this will end up creating a path difference, which will end up creating a phase difference, which will cause a superposition in the microphone. In method B, the microphone is moved to the left or to the right with the loudspeaker. Now, this one here will involve the use of a stationary wave, which is created between the two speakers. Okay, we need to this 
Okay, we need to describe and explain how both methods can be used to accurately determine the speed of sound. In your description, describe, discuss how the uncertainty, the value of the speed of sound can be minimized in one of those methods without using any other apparatus. Okay, so let's describe and explain how both methods can be used to determine the speed of sound. So I'm gonna start off with method A. Let's start off with describe, which is literally the command word in our six marker. So I would say uh, vary the position of the loudspeaker and measure the distance between adjacent maxima. Yeah. In a way, this is similar to Young's double slit experiment where the uh, path difference between adjacent maxima is equal to n multiplied by lambda. Then we could calculate the speed of sound using the value of the frequency of the signal generator multiplied by the actual measured wavelength. Let's also explain, because this is what the question is asking us to do. So how does this work? So as we vet so as, we vary the, so as we vary the position of the speaker, we are introducing a path difference, which introduces a phase difference. And the condition for a maximum is that, it's an, that the path difference is an integer multiple of the wavelength. I would also say that waves from both speakers will superpose. And let's do the same for method B. So in method B, we're actually gonna have a stationary wave. So I'm gonna start with the description. So with the stationary wave method, we want to measure the distance between adjacent antinodes. It can also work with nodes, by the way. In a stationary wave, the distance between adjacent nodes or antinodes is half the wavelength. And this is probably what this question is testing us on. Then we want to calculate the wavelength as double the distance and then once again use our speed of sound equation. Let's also explain what is actually happening in method B. So a station wave is formed when two waves that travel in opposite directions superpose. I may even just draw a small diagram to showcase that I know what's actually happening. So what we're actually doing in this is, let's say if we're finding the distance between two adjacent uh, antinodes, this distance here is going to be half the wavelength. There's one more thing that we need to do in this question, and that is to describe and explain how both methods, okay, now we've done that. In your description, discuss how the uncertainty in the value for the speed of sound can be minimized in one of the methods without using any other apparatus. Okay, so if we were to pick, let's say, this one across here, if we want to minimize uncertainty without using any different apparatus, in general, percentage uncertainty is equal to your plus or minus absolute uncertainty. Your absolute uncertainty is just determined by your measuring instrument, right? So this only depends on the resolution. So if we're not changing this, we cannot really control the absolute uncertainty. What we can change though is our measurement value. So one way of increasing the measurement value would be to actually increase the wavelength. If you think about it, it would be a lot easier to measure a wavelength, which is let's say one meter long compared if it was just two millimeters long. And because the speed of sound is constant in air, we could use a lower frequency, meaning that the wavelength will end up increasing. Another classic example would be to measure over multiple wavelengths and then divide by the number of wavelengths that you've actually measured. And I'm reasonably happy with this answer. If I had a little bit more time, let's say at the end of the paper, I might come back to the six marker and add in a couple of extra details. Thank you so much for watching guys. If you would like a little bit of extra explanation on the longitudinal waves, I have a detailed in-depth video on this that I'm gonna leave right over here. Hope this is useful, enjoy.